Okay. Hello. Happy Wednesday. Uh, my laptop uh, seems firmly convinced that the internet does not exist, so we're uh, giving the old reboot to see if that uh, jogs its memory. Uh, any questions on the, the lab or the quiz uh, to get us started? Christopher. Um, on the list, the third question, mm -hmm. um, how are we supposed to get the level um, in the tree if it's not in the tree? Yes, so uh, this is the, the, the tricky part of the question. The observation I would, would make that might help is, let's say we have uh, a tree, may go down quite a ways. When we call this depth sum initially, it will be given a root. For if we're given the root, do we know what the depth of that node is without needing to know anything else about the tree? Yeah, we know that it's uh, right at the root, so we would say depth zero, this depth sum, and say multiply it by one. We also know that its children are then multiplied by two. They're kind of one deeper than the root. And so by starting at the root and working down, you might be able to keep track of kind of how deep you have gone. And this is why there's that hint about writing a helper method, because one way we can keep track of something uh, when we're doing recursive calls is by having that something as a parameter to the recursive calls. So I would say think about how you might do this such that each recursive call like, know, is told like what depth it's at except for the very initial call to depth sum, which will be with the root, and you will know what the factor to use there is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Elena? If we use a method Yes, as long as the quiz5.java that you submit compiles, and when you run it, it passes the tests, like, that's all that, that's required. So. You're, you're free to, to implement other helper methods as well. Other questions? All right. So last time we were talking about binary search trees. And uh, the, the big advantage of these binary search trees is that they keep data in an ordered way. And something that we looked at for a hash table is a find min operation. That we wanted we thought about okay, if we implemented some method of a hash table to find the minimum key in the hash table. Does anyone remember uh, what the efficiency of, say, finding the, the minimum key in the hash table was? Well, I can choose league or... Yeah, on a hash table, it was big O of n because we didn't know anything about Kind of where to find the minimum key. So we just had to look through all n keys. So if we, uh, let's imagine that we now have a find min method that we're calling on a binary search tree node. And conceptually, if we have uh, some tree that again has some, some structure, maybe it goes pretty deep, uh, starting at the root, and we're looking for the minimum, do we know 
which direction we would go to try and find the minimum. Uh, why would we go left? The smaller value goes to the left. Exactly. That our binary search tree says whatever key is at the root, everything smaller than it is at is to the left. Uh, so we go one step to the left. Uh, have we found the minimum? How how would we know if we found the minimum? Ben. Uh, let's say. Our tree looks like this. When we're here, have we found the minimum? Yeah. Uh, no, because, or yes, sorry, because you can no longer go left. Exactly. That when we can't go left anymore, when there's no nodes that are smaller than the current node, we have found the minimum. So. I'd like you to take a couple of minutes and with your neighbors, try and write down that algorithm to find the minimum in Java code. Uh, and this can be done either iteratively using a loop or recursively. You are free to, to take either approach. Uh, but see if you can code up our, our kind of go left as far as you can. Uh, find min. All right. Let's uh, talk about how this might work. Uh, who can give me a, a suggestion for how I might start this out? Jeffrey? the base cases. Yeah, so like what's something that I want to, to check? If uh, the root itself is null, then do I return zero? Or, yeah. yeah, so if I have an empty tree, if the node is null, uh, different things that, that we might do in this case, I would tend to say that trying to find the minimum in an empty tree is like that's not a that's not an operation that makes sense and we should let uh the caller know that by throwing an exception so i might throw a no such element exception as a way of indicating that you have called find min on an empty tree that that's an invalid operation, uh, but more generally, finding min on an empty tree, that's kind of an undefined operation. So uh, if the, another way to look at it is if someone calls find min on an empty tree, that's sort of their problem and you can do whatever you want. Uh, but reasonable thing would be to, to throw an exception. All right, so we've checked for that. Uh, someone else give me what's a what's the next step I might do? Ben? Um, if you have just the one you know, like if the root dot left is null, then you just return that root. Yeah, if I can't go left, if my root dot left is null, I have found the minimum. Now, I didn't actually tell you what type of thing this is supposed to return, whether it's returning the minimum key or the value at the node with the minimum key or the minimum node itself. Kind of any of those could be a version of find min that you, you want. Uh, I might just say kind of return, return the node that has the, the minimum thing. But uh, you could specify this in to be looking for a key or a value as well. All right, so I've checked a, uh, for a couple cases. Uh, what's something I might do after this? Uh, you, you want to make that a custom call? 
Yeah, a recursive call seems seems like a, a nice idea. What would my recursive call be? Uh, find min and then it would be dot left. Yeah, I want to, to find the minimum of the left subtree because the minimum's down in there somewhere. Uh, is this the full full line that I would need here? Yeah, I want to the the result this call should return is whatever the minimum to the left is. Christopher. Um, what is is the row new no fifth element exception? Do we like basically write that out or we just we just uh, so this, in order to like have this method cause an error, an exception to happen, like when Feynman is ca called on an empty tree, you would literally put in throw new no such element exception. Uh, but uh, this sort of error handling and exceptions is not a focus of, of what we're doing in this class. So it would be fine to like return null or or kind of other responses are, are fine, um, but it's, it's important to check for this case and do something, because if you don't and you get to root.left, now you have a, a null pointer exception. Other questions? In. If you left that return out and like run a find min, like what would happen then? Uh, your code would not compile. Okay. Uh, it's assuming that the return type of find min is not void. If my return type was, like in this case, I'm returning the node. So if my return type was BST node, and I didn't have this return, the compiler would say, you can get to the end of this non-void function having never returned anything. And that's not valid. So it would force you to have some sort of return that wasn't inside an if, um, so that you're guaranteed to return something of type BST node. Uh, so yeah, we wouldn't get compiling code until we had that return. Yeah, which is one of the nice things about a compiler. In Python, we could leave out that return. Python would be totally cool. It would just return none, all is well until then it isn't. Um, but the compiler can catch these sort of, these sort of problems. Other questions? Anyone do this uh, in an iterative way using a loop? Luke? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just um, said, well, first I created an int for like the minimum, since that's what I was finding. Mm -hmm. And then I said, um, wow, root dot left does not equal null. Put um, the minimum equals root dot left dot data, and then root equals root dot left. Yeah, so we can kind of do our like just repeatedly going left either with a, a recursive call or with a loop. Uh, the sort of the sort of loops that we saw with link lists, where we just kind of keep kind of updating our variable to go left and left and left. Does this make sense? Questions on this? How would it work if we wanted to find the maximum instead of the minimum? Every? Just switch left to right. Yeah, we just go all the way right as far as we could instead of all the way left, and we'd find the maximum. Uh, so we said that a hash table could do this find min in big O of n time. Uh, and so let's. Uh, and I promise we're going to, uh, on Friday, we're going to get to wh why we can make this assumption. But assuming we have a balanced tree, uh, can anyone remember from last time, remind us what balanced means in terms of our trees? Liam? Like... There's like an equal amount of children on both sides. It's not like 
one length less basically. Exactly. It's the uh, it's the height of our two children differ by at most one. So like the sides are roughly like they're very close in the in the kind of the nose to each side. Uh, so assuming that we have this sort of balanced, uh, when we're kind of analyzing this uh, either this this iterative or this recursive version, I want to think well. How many recursive calls do we have to make? Kind of how many fine men of root dot left, or how many times do we go around this loop for a tree of, of n nodes? Paul? Log yeah, why do you say log in? Just a bit of a balanced tree that we're basically cutting out half of all the observations each time. Yeah, we saw exactly, and we saw last time that if we uh, increase the height by one, we basically double the number of nodes in the tree. So uh, we can kind of write that uh, for n nodes, we have log n height. Uh, for our balanced tree, we've certainly seen we can get the linked list trees. That would not follow this. But for our balanced tree, for n nodes, we have log n height. And when we're going all the way left, the furthest we could go is the full height of the tree. Because that height is the longest path to a, path to a leaf. And if our, the furthest away leaf, if that is the minimum, uh, the full height is as long as we could go. Does that make sense? And so this is a big a big win for for the trees, right? The the the, the mighty hash table could only do as, as well as big O of n, but our, our balanced binary search tree uh, can can find the minimum uh, in in log of n time, or the maximum. Or any particular particular value it's looking for. All right, let's do. Oh, Edorome has has seen the light. I have internet now. I'm, I'm over the moon. Have to type in the long pass. All right, wonderful. So uh, let's do a, a bit of practice with thinking how nodes get added to a binary tree. Have a, a, a binary search tree, have one pictured here, uh, and four different possible orders in which these keys were inserted. So, like A here would mean we added eight to the tree, then four, then six, then two, and, and so on. So which of these four would not give us the tree that is pictured there? All right. Uh, it is going to be the, uh, the majority here, C. So... Uh, can someone explain why C would give us a different tree than what is pictured here? Cam? Well, 4 is a parent node to both 2 and 6, so 6 can't be added to 4 and 4. Exactly. That if we had added 6 uh, second, 6 would be right here. We would have inserted 6 directly after 8, and then indeed all other nodes would have to, to show up somewhere below it. Questions on that? All right. So let's uh, actually put uh, put some code. Not this one. Okay. So uh, operating systems preview for you. But let's. Go to the trees. 
All right, so I want to cut up a binary search tree class that is going to work like a map. That is going to have keys that control like where the, the nodes are and then a value that kind of goes along uh, uh, with that. So kind of each node will have both a key and a value uh, uh, in it. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, like I did with our the link list, uh, make a private internal class to keep track of the nodes. So up to this point, we've been working with uh, things that are, are just nodes. But if we want an actual like tree data structure, we typically have kind of a, a, a tree, uh, uh, like a binary search tree class that kept track of something like a, that like kept track of what the root of the tree was. And each of our nodes will have uh, uh, a uh, left and a right and a key and a value. And I'll just make a constructor where the constructor takes in a particular key and value and then sets the fields, key, and value to those parameters. With me so far on this, this node class? Okay, so what I want to go through now and the code that I am writing uh, up here, uh, you can find on the course calendar as bst.java. Uh, it's another file in, in the folder here. So that will be a kind of more complete version than what I have time to go through here in class, uh, if you want to refer to that. Uh, but what I want to focus on is uh, how we would code up uh, a put method to add a oops uh, uh, to add a key value pair kind of as a new node in our tree or like a map did if the key already exists at some node replace the value uh, so to start out what uh, what might be a, 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 a thing that I would check for first before I uh, uh, would do anything else? Paul? Are there any elements in the tree? Yeah, is the tree empty? Always, could always be the case and something I, I uh, will, will always want to check for. Uh, any suggestions for how I would know that a tree, that this tree was empty? Peter? If the overall node is null. Exactly. That I have this field that is just the very top root of the tree. If that's null, there's nothing in the tree. Uh, and if there's nothing in the tree and I'm putting something into it, I just need to put that thing at the root. There's nowhere else uh, for it to go. So I can just say the overall root is a new node with this key and value. If that is not the case, if there is something in the tree, uh, I'm going to want to be able to write this put in a recursive way. Uh, just like we saw here, it can be done iteratively. It could be done iteratively, it could be done recursively. Uh, but uh, I will do it recursively because that tends to make this sort of code uh, 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 um, a little cleaner. And so uh, if I were to do this recursively, I would need to keep track of kind of what node of the tree I'm on. 
Uh, and uh, if I'm going to keep track of what node of the tree I'm on uh, in a recursive method, typically that needs to be a parameter of my recursive method. If it's something this, this recursion is keeping track of, so I'll say put starting at the overall root this key and value. Uh, and this means that I will need a private version of put that takes in a node, a key, and a value. So if there's nothing in the tree, I'm just going to fill in the root. Otherwise, I'm going to kind of recursively find the spot to put the new node. Uh, uh, and to recursively find the spot, I kind of need to keep track of, all right, where in the tree am I currently at? What is kind of the root of whatever part of the tree uh, uh, this method is in? So if I'm kind of at some, some node and I'm looking for where this key goes. Does it go at this node? Does it go to the left? Does it go to the right? Uh, what should I, like, what's something that I could do to figure that out? I'm going to just check the data of the root itself and um, compare it to the overall root's data. And yeah, that's that's a great suggestion. I might want to say something like, if the key at the root, uh, well, if the key that I'm trying to insert is less than the key at the root, uh, go left. Else, if the key is greater than the key at the root, go right. If it's neither less than nor greater than, what are we what are we left with? It's equal, right? Yeah. So uh, and and for a map, if we have a, a, a the, if we're putting a key that matches some key that's already there, what do we do? Yeah, we we replace the value associated with that key with the new value that we're putting in. So, uh, questions on this so far? Luke. Can you explain why you're comparing the keys instead of the values for the first two if statements? Yes, so uh, if we uh, think about how we use a map, uh, how a hash table or how a hash table works, uh, we want to kind of put in a key value pair and then later, using the key, find out what value is in the map. And so the, the, we need to use the thing to decide to go left or right that we're going to use to like look up. Uh, if we want to be able to like find where a key is later, we better be able to follow the keys at the node in order to like find where that key is. Now, so on the tree, the the data of the node wouldn't be the key. I mean, wouldn't be the value, it would be the key. Uh, in this case, all nodes have both a key and a value. Uh, and so uh, you might, so one way to think about this uh, would be uh, uh, we have, uh, we, we, we're using this map to have some sort of contact directory uh, a phone book type situation where we have names and phone numbers. Uh, and uh, we could organize things, uh, and if we wanted to organize it in some way, uh, we technically could, could sort it by phone number, uh, but that would be probably not very useful. Um, like what, what person has the, the first phone number is just not a question I imagine myself needing the answer to. Uh, but like, having a name in mind, wanting to quickly find the associated phone number. That's something that I might want to do. And so in that case, I would want the keys at the nodes, kind of how they're sorted, to be alphabetically by name. And then also at the node, there's this phone number that's the value that 
I might want to like, given a name, be able to get back the phone number. Does that make sense? I do. I'm a little, if you scroll down a little bit, I was a little confused why we made like the recursive uh, call for, with put, but we made another private put like, on line 24. Yes, yeah, so uh, we haven't gotten to how we will use the recursion yet, but uh, we need a version of put that is going to keep track of what node it is at. Yeah. This version of put doesn't have a parameter for that. Yeah. And so I need a version that does take a node as a parameter. Uh, and I made it private because someone using my binary search tree is just going to be working in terms of, key, of keys and values. I want to hide all the messy details of like what I'm doing with nodes uh, from the person using the class. Just like a linked list, uh, we kind of hide the node away and you're just adding or moving things from the linked list. And so like with the computer now, you're talking about the put in line 24 because it has three parameters instead. Exactly. That we even if it had two, if those two had different types than some another put that had two parameters, it could tell the difference. Okay. So it figures out both by number of parameters and what type they are. And Java won't let you define two methods that have the same name, take the same number of parameters, and all the parameters have the same type. It will say these are duplicates and that's not allowed. Other questions? So you may have noticed that these less than or greater than are underlined in red. Uh, and it actually says the operator type less than is undefined for like these two keys. Um, and that's because uh, and there's a lot of detail about this in the notes on sorting. If you want to go back in the calendar and look at that, not something we had time to, to dive into in class. Uh, but in Java, our less than and greater than uh, only work with primitive types. Just like our double equal sign only works, like we use that with primitive types, but we use dot equals when we're talking about objects. It's the same idea here. We would do uh, key dot compare to root dot key is how you compare two objects. And in order to tell Java that my keys must have a compare to method, uh, which is in fact something that we need, we need to be able to say one key is less than another. If we can't compare keys, our whole like putting things less than to the left, greater than to the right doesn't work. We would say that our key implements the comparable interface implements uh, interesting what am I ah, it's extends not implements so this is Java's typically very verbose way of saying uh, you can compare things of type K, you can compare them to other things of type K. Uh, the details of this uh, are not, not critical to us, it's just how we have to write this stuff in Java. Uh, there's, um, as I said, notes in, in, the, in the sorting topic uh, if you want to, to read about that more. Uh, but that's going to let us do this compare to, and it's going to return an integer. And that integer is going to tell us what the result of the comparison was. Where the integer returned by compare to, if it's less than zero, that means key was less than root dot key. If that integer is greater than zero, that means key was greater than root dot key. And if it is zero, that means that they're equal. Uh, if I got to wave my magic wand, uh, and change Java, this would be on my list. It's not, uh, not the most intuitive way to compare things, but it is the world that we live in. So, now we have our function being able to go left and go right. 
And in each of these, we have when we go when we go left, there are two cases. Anyone think of what those two cases would be if we're kind of looking to our left child? There are two possible things it could be. Could it be that it has another child? Uh, so it might have another child or, or not. That's definitely on the right track. Uh, what if we apply that to the current node, to root? Jake? Um, either there is a left node or there isn't. Yeah, we don't know whether we even have a left child. Root.left might be null if we don't have a left child. Uh, so I would need to check if root.left is null or not. If it is null, I found an empty spot in the tree where this key would go. That this the key is less than root dot key, and I would go to the left, but there's nothing there, so that's where I should put my new key. So I can just say root dot left equals new node key value, and it's this else case where I could recursively say put this. Uh, uh, put this key value pair into uh, the, the left subtree from root. What are your questions on this? Uh, and going to the right would be Exactly the same as this, just changing dot left to, to dot right. All right. And this is kind of a nice example of both how we use recursion to go through a tree and of how we search, okay, is it less, add a particular node, is it less than the current node, greater than the current node? Um, all right. So let's take... Uh, let's take a, a, a quick break from our uh, binary search tree and talk about uh, President William McKinley. Ben? <laughs> Not about McKinley, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's that's a, a a good point. That when we have a tree, uh, like three, two, one, seven, eight. Uh, if um, maybe. Seven ten, and we want to uh, kind of put uh, eight into the tree. We might say, well, it'd be convenient that eight could go here. Uh, but the way that a, a binary search tree works is that we uh, we're not going to change any of the the nodes that are already in there. We'd say it's greater than 3, greater than 7, less than 10, and 8 would go there. Yeah, so we're always, add, whenever we add a new node, it's adding a new leaf to our tree. Other questions? Okay, I know that you're, you're dying to find out about William McKinley. Yeah. Uh, he uh, uh, first first president since uh, Grant to uh, actually serve uh, to, to to win re-election, serve a second term, uh, a, a a very uh, kind of pro business, pro uh, imperialism uh, Republican. Uh, his campaign was kind of managed and, and bankrolled by uh, this guy named Mark Hanna. 
a wealthy businessman, both he and people like the, the Rockefellers were contributing to McKinley's campaign. Um, and this led to uh, this political cartoon of a tiny William McKinley in Mark Hanna's pocket. So the, 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 the fat cat, Mark Hanna, Hanna uh, had, had kind of bought and paid for uh, uh, McKinley. And uh, McKinley's opponent uh, was this guy, William Jennings Bryan, uh, uh, Midwestern populist, wanted uh, silver coinage and uh, uh, opposed kind of uh, a monopoly in industry. Uh, and Bryan was not only McKinley's opponent in 1896, he was McKinley's opponent again in 1900. And these were not the only two times that Bryan would run for, for president. Uh, so, so we'll be we'll be hearing about him again, uh, but he was soundly defeated uh, both times, as he would be every time, um, and uh, uh, he was kind of mocked for his eclectic uh, set of uh, policies. And the Demo uh, uh, says, "I'm going to be making fun of the Democratic platform as this sort of strange chimera, where it said he made it all by himself." Meaning, little uh, uh, Jennings Bryan here. Um, and when McKinley ran for re-election, he added the uh, well-known but uh, also eccentric uh, and pugnacious Theodore Roosevelt as vice president. Roosevelt kind of represented a different wing of the Republican Party. And people at the time said this was like people that, that were of um, kind of Mark Hanna's frame of mind. So this, this is a bad idea. This maniac, meaning Roosevelt, is now one heartbeat away from the presidency. Uh, this became very relevant when at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York, this man, Leon Cholgage, walked up and shot President McKinley, uh, and he died shortly thereafter, uh, at which point Theodore Roosevelt became president. It's also, as I mentioned, a, a, a heyday of... of uh, uh, American expansion during this time, America fought a war with Spain, annexed Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, occupied Cuba with the U.S. Army, uh, and also annexed Hawaii during McKinley's first term. All right. That's uh, our presidential facts for today. So what I think that I'd like to do now is... Uh, talk about how we can um, uh, uh, how we can traverse uh, the values in a binary search tree. Uh, so I will redraw this tree a little bit, and we have the values. Uh, one, two, three, uh, four, five in this tree. And uh, I've claimed that the tree keeps these values in order. Uh, but if we wanted to print out this tree and get the values printed out in sorted order, uh, it's not clear kind of how we would necessarily like go through the, this particular tree to be able to get them out in sorted order. Uh, and this is where our tree traversals come into play. So I'll have several kinds. Uh, but the relevant one for this problem of let's get things out in sorted order is called appropriately the in order traversal. And it says the following. Uh, We're going to in order traversal the left then we're going to print the current node And then we're going to traverse the right. And we can look at how this approach kind of 
uh, uh, goes through this tree. We would start at the root. First thing we do is recursively traverse the left child. All right, now we're at one. Next thing we do is recursively traverse the left child. It's null. So this is assuming we have a base case here that if we hit a tree that's null, we just return. So now we're back at one and we print it out. And then recursively traverse the right child. It tries its children, both uh, it tries its left child, that's null, it then prints out itself. Uh, it tries its right child, that's null, returns back to one. One has now finished this recursive call on its right, so it's back to three. Three just got, so when one returns, that's three's traversal of its left child, and so three will now print out itself. recursively call on its right. First thing its right child does is recursively call on its left. This is a leaf, so all it's going to do is print out itself. And then it returns to five, at which point five prints out itself. And voila, we are using this in order traversal algorithm. We went through and ended up printing out all the keys in our tree in sorted order. Marcus? Sorry. No. Uh, questions on this? Does this make sense? Brian? Um, so does it have to be like, maybe I'm not like understanding, or like does, like if the orders of the numbers were like changed, would that affect the? Uh, yes, great question. So what if we had, made a change to this tree, so it looked like this instead, would it still work? Yeah. Uh, so let's just focus on what would it do on this left side. The root first traverses its left, that goes to two, then it first traverses its left, that goes to one, one would get printed out, and then two would get printed out. So this works because we know everything to the left of us is less, so that should get printed out first. Once that's printed, we know that we're in between everything to our left and everything to our right, so uh, the current node should come after everything to its left, but before then everything to its right. Uh, and this kind of applies recursively at any level of the tree. Other questions? Uh, what would be the base case for this? Uh, so we can think of that if uh, uh, that if node is null, just return. Okay. So when we kind of get down to one. It recursively calls on its left, but that's null, so that just returns. Prints out itself, recursive call on its right, that's null, it just returns. Uh, so it's basically a base case, it says just ignore uh, kind of null spots. And so if you call this on an empty tree, you just wouldn't print out anything, uh, which would be appropriate. Other questions? So we have. Uh, other names, uh, other kinds of traversals. We have pre-order and post-order. These come up a lot less often, uh, but all they involve is changing where we print out the node. In our pre-order, we would print out the node before its children, hence the pre. And for post order, we would print out the node after processing its children. And so we have this kind of same idea of we're recursively processing the children and also doing something for ourselves. And just when that happens, uh, determines kind of what kind of traversal we're doing in order, pre order, uh, or post order.
let's take a moment and do a bit of analysis. So if we have a tree of n nodes, as usual, uh, and we do this in order traversal, uh, how kind of how many recursive calls, like how many uh, of our nodes will we kind of go through uh, in doing a, an in order traversal? We saw that when we did our in order traversal of this example tree, we kind of went through each node, like we had a recursive call that occurred at each of our five nodes in the tree. And these sort of traversals, are, they're going to kind of visit each of the nodes once um, in different orders, but our kind of in order traversal will be big O of n because we'll go through each of our end nodes one time. And so given a tree of end nodes, and uh, we can get out all the nodes in perfectly sorted order uh, in big O of n time. If we had a hash table with n entries, uh, what, how much work would it take to get the entries in the hash table in sorted order according to the key? Our hash table recalls an unsorted array. Anyone remember what our kind of uh, uh, how good we how, what it would take to take in data and actually sort it? Can you just have to like loop through all the elements, get them, and then sort that data once you've gotten. Um, let's say that we yeah, so we do an order n like copy over all of our. Uh, key value pairs so that then we can then we can sort them. Um, Surfing? I was going to say, is it um, O and it makes it a second? Uh, what, uh, do you have a, a technique in mind that we're using to, to sort our, uh, our array of, of key value pairs? I mean, my, the way I got to this was like, okay, you copy over the entries, and then you have to go through it again, and then compare each one, and then you change the entries. Uh, yes, yeah, so th this is absolutely the right idea. We want to use some algorithm to kind of, and we could, uh, there are sorting algorithms that are big O of n squared. We're kind of comparing each, each pair of, uh, of elements. Anyone remember on, uh, maybe a more efficient sorting algorithm that we talked about, Paul? Sort. Yeah, we talked about merge sort. So if we just used merge sort on our unsorted hash table, uh, what was the efficiency of merge sort? Uh, n log n. Indeed, it was n log n. So we have a hash table. We can get the sorted data, but it takes n log n work. And also some additional memory, most likely, as part of that sorting algorithm. Whereas our, uh, our tree in order traversal, that we can just get the sorted order in, in, in a big O of n time. So again, we're, we're seeing the advantage of keeping things in a tree structure that keeps them in some sort of, in a sorted order, if we want to do operations that, that involve the order of the data, such as you know, getting all the keys out in sorted order. Questions on that? Uh, I would observe that 
uh, this in order traversal does not uh, uh, does not make me a liar uh, when I told you that we can't do better than n log n for sorting uh, because we don't just start out with a tree that has all these nodes in some in some order. We actually need to put each of the nodes into the tree in order to get to the point where we can do this in order traversal. And each of uh, and if we're adding n nodes to the tree and our kind of algorithm of finding where to put the node, we've seen that's log n, and we do that for n different nodes. We're back to n log n. However, once if we do this once, make our binary search tree once, then we can kind of efficiently get everything in sorted order um, uh, uh, every time. Whereas our hash table, we just have to like completely sort the data uh, from scratch every time. All right. So last. Uh, last thing that I want to uh, want to talk about is uh, briefly mention the the topic of removing a node from a binary search tree. Uh, so we've talked about adding nodes into it. Uh, but we haven't talked about taking nodes out of the tree. Uh, well, let's consider this tree here. And uh, if we can figure out how to remove uh, how to remove the, the root of a tree, we'll actually have figured out how to do any kind of removal. Because every node is the root of kind of the subtree at that point. And so we can figure out an algorithm for removing a root. We can kind of apply that at whatever point the node is that we're removing that would affect just sort of the tree that, that starts with that node. So first question, uh, if we remove three, we, can't do, we, we don't want an empty root. Because if it's just empty, it won't help us know, like, do we go left or right if we're looking for something. So if we remove three, we've got to put something there in its place. So I'll uh, you take just a minute and discuss with your neighbors which of the nodes here could we put in, like, which of these one, two, four, or five could we put here and have this still be a valid binary search tree? Oh, five, two, or four. Yeah, we can, if we put two up here, then we still have a valid tree because it's smaller than stuff to the right, bigger than stuff to the left. If we put four up here, the same thing is true. And we would we maintain our kind of order property. Uh, but either five or one would end up breaking the rules. As one being here, we have two to its left. It's not less, uh, two's not less than one. We have five up here, we have four to its right. Four is not greater than five. And we actually have uh, terms for what two and four are relative to our former root of three. Two is what's called the predecessor of uh, three, and four is what's called the successor. And I think uh, one way to think of these is the predecessor of a node is kind of the next smallest thing. Uh, the thing that comes right before it 
in the uh, uh, in the in order traversal. The thing that comes right before it uh, in the order of the keys, and the successor is the one that comes right after it. Uh, we can make these kind of in more precise uh, tree terms, uh, where our predecessor is like the predecessor of some node. is the rightmost left descendant of node. Meaning that if we want to find the thing that comes right after 3, we should go to the left and then go as far right as we can. Basically, find the biggest thing in the left subtree. As the biggest thing that's less than 3 would be the thing that comes right before it. And if we put all the nodes in order, and our successor is kind of the inverse of this, the leftmost right descendant. Uh, and so when we remove a root, we need to replace it with its successor or predecessor. And if we pick one of these, uh, either of these, in this case 2 and 4, will work as a replacement for the root. And so that's actually how removal from a binary search tree will work. You remove the node, you find its successor or predecessor, and you kind of move that key up to where uh, to fill the root. Um, and uh, if you kind of dig into uh, the notes for today, you'll see that we may have to consider uh, what if two or four kind of had children. Um, we know 2 is the greatest thing to the left, but it could have a left child, or it could have a right child, and we need to reattach those to the tree. But now the thing to take away is that uh, when we remove from the tree, we find so something to replace it and kind of reorganize the tree in that way. Uh, that will be all that we have time for today. So keep working on... Uh, the lab. I have office hours tomorrow evening, uh, and I'll see you on Friday. Uh, and the, the quiz due 9 p.m. tonight.